one, one business that I'm involved in is called Cavalry Ventures. It's an early stage venture fund. We have frequent contact with with the team here or, or also in Paris because obviously there's a lot of interesting teams and companies coming out of, of uh, I, w I wanted to say program, but it's not a program, but it's sort of the family. Um, so uh, there's quite some connections there. And uh, so yeah, again, thanks for uh, uh, inviting me. Um, as Lou said, um, I'm currently uh, doing two things essentially. So one is um, I'm the CEO of a company called, or used to be called, Book a Tiger, and now we're in the process of changing to Tiger Facility Services. And then I'm a partner at the, the fund Calorie Ventures, Early Stage Venture Fund. Um, and so that's sort of filling my day. Uh, what qualifies me to be here today? Um, I, you know, try to start something successful or have been trying to start something successful for the past 18 years. Uh, sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. Uh, and even then, when it worked, um, you know, it hasn't been fuck up free. So there's a, there's a big portion of, uh, let's say, learnings involved, even in the, or maybe mostly even in the, in the companies that, that worked out or are working out, hopefully. Yeah. Um, so when we discussed the topic, um, we thought the whole, you know, it's a bit softer topic, company culture could be interesting. Um, and then we got to like how to have a, a culture that sort of survives when, you know, things do not go well. Yeah. And that's how uh, um, I think, frankly, you came up with the topic, Lou. Um, but I think it's a really good topic because it's not uh, uh, talked about so often. And I think it is from an entrepreneur and also from an investor's perspective a, a key ingredient um, in, a, in a successful company. Because very rarely does uh, do things go according to plan. Yeah? So um, I want to basically structure this in like two parts. Um, at the end, we do some questions. Um, first, I have a few sort of uh, things that I believe are essential for uh, a good company culture. So a bit more theory, if you wish. And then I have uh, three or four uh, very concrete cases of where company culture uh, really helped uh, the company uh, to not die yeah? and then succeed. So company culture is often uh, you know, mistaken with, we do a lot of events, we get shit-faced once a week and we have a kicker in the, in the football table in the, in the office. Um, and, and while that might be somewhat part of, of what makes uh, the company culture, uh, it's definitely not the foundation. Yeah? So for me, foundation of company culture are essentially three things. So one is vision. Yeah? So sort of a sense of purpose and why do I do that? And where are we going? The other one is hiring team. So a well-functioning team. Um, is sort of the second uh, point for me. And then the, the third one is transparency, um, which means to me that everyone needs to understand where are we at, what is going well, and what is not going well. And then there's certain, you know, I would say uh, 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 tricks or um, things you can, you can institutionalize that support these uh, uh, three uh, yeah, bullets, if you wish. So, on vision. Um, it's quite interesting when you start a company, you know, there's a few things that you start doing, you think of a name, and then, um, you know, you think of your brand, and then maybe you cut out uh, things from newspapers and make a mood board, or you copy-paste pictures from Pinterest, and so on and so forth. And then there's always this thing uh, where it's like, okay, vision of the company, and you're like, ah, oh, this is like, this is uh, really exhausting to think about. Why do I need to think about this? I'll do that later. I would highly encourage you to not do that later. Why? Because really like thinking about what do I want to build and more importantly, why do I want to build it is really sort of the foundation for future decision making. And that sounds a bit you know, lofty, but sometimes there are business decisions where you're like, okay, make more money screw a customer, make more money, or um, think long term and do, don't, don't screw the customer. And, and then there are things where your vision or how you articulate it, maybe also values, 
um, really help you um, to make those decisions. If you don't know what you're about, then you cannot make uh, good decisions that really support the long-term uh, success of the company. Also, in terms of operational um, you know, agility and speed, having a vision and also a mission that makes sense and that is understood by your employees reduces friction. Because everyone knows where to go and how to get there in broad terms. So it reduces friction and it increases the speed of decision making in the, in the company because everyone is aligned on the general uh, vision. We have an onboarding presentation and uh, at least one person in the audience has seen this on onboarding or has been part of this onboarding presentation at uh, Book of Tiger. Um, and basically we tell every new employee what this is, what our values are, and, and we ask uh, um, every new employee to leave if uh, she or he does not subscribe to this. Um, and so and we do this repeatedly and, and this is really important for me. Um, second, again, uh, hiring and team. This is a bit of a thing where you're like, yeah, okay, I, I know that. But I can tell you from experience, like, do not, like, never, ever, ever fill a position. It's the dumbest thing you can do in your company. Like, if you're, like, really need, whatever, an accountant, and you're like, okay, the guy's a brilliant accountant, he's an asshole, I don't like him, but he's a brilliant accountant, I'll just hire that person in order to fill the position. The, the, the decision you're making is wrong for, with a certainty of 99.9%. .9 because I've been there, done that for engineers, for um, accountants, um, and, <laughs> um, and it's always been wrong. You're going to find uh, yourself in three months searching for the accountant again. Yeah, not the movie, the accountant. Um, so do not, like there's this thing, do not this rule, do not hire brilliant assholes. And it's not just a saying, it's really like, it, I mean, it's really true. Like don't, also if you have investors and the investor goes like, you need to hire a head of sales. Uh, we just invested 4 million euros in your company. Now get your shit together, hire a head of sales. And, and then by the way, here's a candidate, which we like. If you don't like this candidate, or then don't hire him or her. Yeah. So really be very strict. We have a portfolio company um, uh, based in London. The two founders are hardcore on this. It's really, really, really hardcore. Like they, they hire the best. The, the standards are crazy high. The company is going nuts, like in terms of growth. And it's just not just the business model is good as well, but the team is really insanely good and they work well together to a very, very, like amazingly well together. Yeah? Um, also, if you have to choose sort of personal fit or company fit of a person over experience, like always, or, or experience, always go for the person. It's really like the whole experience thing, especially with experienced engineers, for example, can destroy like your, your culture in an engineering team because it just brings a different or the wrong set of, of learned behavior that you do not need in your company. Um, and then transparency, and I think um, that's also something where you can sort of, you know, have a couple of uh, building blocks very early on in your company. Right, so we have a, a, an event in Book of Tiger on every Friday. It's called Tiger Feast. It's a pretty simple thing. So every Friday afternoon, we present how the business is doing. Yeah. So, what's the target? Are we missing the target? Are we hitting the target? How much revenue do we do? And then there's like information or thoughts. Sometimes, how do we think about fundraising? Uh, do we have a, what, whatever problems do we have? Um, we, we share a lot with our team. Of course, it's like there is certain levels to transparency in a sense that don't scare your team, right? There's some things where that might, that might be too transparent or that scare people, um, but, gen but generally try to so share as much information as possible because it helps everyone to, s to start thinking on themselves and, and work on problem solving in case there is a problem. And, you know, at the, I, have, I meet a lot of founders who are like, yeah, but then my competition knows how much revenue I do. Fuck it. Like, really. It's like, what, do they, what are they going to do with this? It's like, yeah, oh, my competitor does 300,000 euros in revenue. It's like, yay. How actionable is that? 
do I go back to my office and I change my whole, you know, whatever strategy and tactics? It's like, no. It's just like, you're not, you know, no one, like, no one cares except yourself. So, but your team, for your team, it's really important to understand, um, you know, how is it going? Uh, do we have enough money? Uh, and all that, that kind of stuff. It is really important. It helped us a lot in, in really um, engaging the team and help us to, to you know, drive the business forward. Um, another thing in the whole transparency uh, topic is goals. Yeah? People and, and everyone needs clear goals um, that need to be achieved, measurable. I know there's this whole, you can do this with OKR, you can do it with whatever you want, but have goals and, and define those and discuss them um, because this creates, it's, it's a tool for good management, but this also creates a good atmosphere because everyone is working on something uh, meaningful yeah? and they want to achieve or tick off a goal. It's quite interesting. Um, if you, like I used to be very hesitant about like goals or, or um, I'm a product manager or an, uh, you all in at the beginning I was an engineer and then I turned a product manager and so on and I always liked freedom because you're the product manager you're supposed to product manage right and then if your boss comes it's like I want this to be yellow and that should be there and so on you're like oh fuck off I'm the product manager I want but the the problem with that is um, you need like it you needs to be very clear what do you, what you want where you're what you're particular about and w where you don't care so it's quite interesting the boundaries or you know clear uh, a direction enables people to be creative it's qu it's quite interesting because otherwise it's like a fake room to be creative because if it's like oh there's you know do whatever you want and then someone comes to you and is like hey i did that it's amazing and you're like i don't like it that's a problem that 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 creates um, that demotivation and so it's really important that whether it's a product manager or any other role that there are clear guidelines clear clear chairs clear goals and that the person your employee n knows what she or he is supposed to do and deliver yeah because if you deliver something if you really believe like I did my best and then you go there and then it turns out that this wasn't what you wanted and then you have to redo it and uh, after the third iteration this person is motivated and will not deliver anything on, on their own anymore. Yeah? So, so for me that's sort of really you know, the three components that you need early on like have a vision, hire well and be transparent and set clear goals. And and if you think about it, you know, that doesn't require much. It doesn't cost a lot of money. Um, so just think about it as part of your business plan. Yeah? So th the same way you, you do a financial model, you're like in Q1, we achieve this, Q2, this, whatever. Think about culture milestones as well and put them into your business plan. Not in a business, not in a financial model, but in your in your uh, uh, you know yearly milestones or roadmap or whatever you have, yeah, because otherwise it's not going to happen. And it's as I said, it's small things like make sure that um, basic processes are working, HR is working, like make sure that all sort of the the um, yeah the ba as I said the basics are are taken care of, yeah, because at the end of the day, I really really believe good company culture is good business as well. Because the thing is, and that's also from, from my you know, own experience, good company culture leads to more productivity. People are happier, um, they might spend more time in the workplace or not, or they might spend less time but be more productive. Um, but in general, um, it leads to more productivity. Also, it leads to less churn, so or, l or less uh, uh, um, fluctuation, so less employee churn. Think about it. Book a Tiger is a cleaning company. So the most boring type of business you can imagine. We have 12 engineers and not a single engineer has left us in the past 16 months. And it's not because we pay amazing salaries. Um, yeah, so, and it's not because they're idiots and would not get another job. Uh, well, at least I hope so. Um, it's, it's because, you know, the team works well. 
um, they they know why they're working on wh on what they're working on, and you know there's generally a good dynamic going on. So for us, not having to hire engineers in Berlin is a big, you know, cost saver if you wish, and also productivity improvement because we don't have to interview a ton of people. It's not a revolving door where we're spending like 10, 15k for headhunters uh, every month and all that kind of stuff. And then lastly you also have to pay less salary because what happens is in an organization with a bad company culture your employees will start asking for more money whether they think about it that way in terms of like oh i need to get paid more for the pain i endure whether it's like an actual thought or it's just a feeling it's going to happen and then after you raise after four months that person will quit yeah, because they realize you, you, they got more money, but it's still shit, right? So ultimately, if you have a good company culture, good organization, it will cost it will cost you less money. Now there are certain. We just had a discussion uh, before uh, Chandra and I. Uh, there are certain cases where you're in a, as an entrepreneur you're in a situation where uh, you might feel like you have to choose. Maybe you have the luxury to choose. Maybe you have a business that is going crazy and, and you're getting, you know, you're, there's so much money thrown at you that you, on, that you don't care about all this, you can do that for a certain period of time, right? If it's like in a hyper growth phase and you don't care about churn and you don't care an about any of that, you can do that for a short period of time. But after sort of your initial year of your company, you really better take this very seriously because otherwise you're missing the foundation for, for raising even more and growing faster. Yeah. So if, if there's a lot of friction in your internal team, hiring adds more friction. So you add outside friction plus people that don't know shit about your business to people that don't like to work there and you, you see how that is not a good mix. Yeah. Um, that took longer than I wanted, but um, so that was the quick <laughs> introduction uh, in terms of uh, you know, the, the, the theory. As I said, um, I've been trying to do this for, for many years. Um, I had and still have a company that is based in uh, Shanghai. Uh, we have about 50 engineers. And I think um, that is a business where we almost made every mistake in the book, um, starting from cultural misunderstandings <laughs> with our Chinese colleagues. Um, uh, to you know, not having any clue how to run a company uh, with that many employees. Um, so I have a few things uh, um, like real-world examples. I will not name a name for these companies, um, but some of them are maybe apparent. Um, so we had a, a one situation with the the company in Shanghai where my co my partners and I um, forgot to pay VAT. Uh, for quite a long period of time, uh, which led to a situation where we had to pay financial authorities about a million euros in fine, in a fine. Now, uh, part of it was the VAT and part of it was sort of the, the, the fine. Yeah? Um, and we obviously did not have one million euros uh, in, in cash. So uh, we established a payment repayment plan and we got uh, the, the father of my two partners, their brothers or our brothers, to lend us some money. And, but um, it was really just a fuck up because we d were not on top of some changing VAT re regulations with regard to the EU and so on. But the, the, the issue was, you know, we, we, ha we didn't have this money. So what we had to do is basically tell everyone in the company that they will not get any salaries for the next uh, months or foreseeable future. And, and I think that was very, very difficult. We had uh, a few guys that left immediately, basically, but a handful. Um, and then we were, it was quite funny, we did that and, and uh, and then we no one really knew what to do, and, and so we decided to go to a sports bar and get drunk with the whole company, um, which was a fun evening, but obviously the problem persisted, so the, you know, the discussion uh, continued the next day. Um, but then what we decided to do was we uh, basically walked everyone through the entire business. So we had multiple uh, web properties that we were uh, running and developing, 
And so we walked everyone through exactly, you know, what's the share of paying uh, users on that website? Is it growing? Yes, no, and so on. So we basically did that for the whole day. And then at the rest of the day, or the end of the day, basically everyone could make up their own mind whether they want to stay or not. Yeah? Um, there, I wasn't really, you know, I didn't like all this VSP or ISOP or options, I didn't, I didn't know back then. So basically we made a bonus program uh, for, for uh, our employees that stayed. And uh, that worked really well. Um, so everyone was like, oh, okay, so if we're growing at this rate, we'll be able to pay this back by that point in time. And, and, um, and so a lot of, uh, actually, mo all of the very important uh, people um, uh, stayed. One of uh, them was Bobby, uh, who then became my first uh, CTO at Lieferheld. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, then, so that uh, worked really well. So that was like sort of very <laughs> sort of radical transparency out of desperation. Yeah? Um, but um, that worked really well. So if you find yourself in a similar situation, think about something like this. Um, another, uh, yeah, I would say exercise that, uh, that I actually did twice uh, was, um, you know, laying off uh, a lot of employees. And from a, how to say, from a sort of practical point of view, <laughs> I would, uh, if you ever find yourself in a situation where you have to let go, let's say 20 people a day, or 20 people, try to do it in one day, yeah? Um, schedule 15 minute meetings and then just get it over with. Do not put everyone in a room and say you're fired. People did that and still do that, it's really dumb and it's gonna hurt your company for a long time uh, because Letting someone go is not a, f you know, a nice thing to do in general and, and doing a bulk firing is not a nice thing uh, uh, square. Yeah? So don't do that. Um, but we, we did that and we were very transparent um, as to who had to leave and why. Um, essentially, the, 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 the tagline was like, you have to leave because uh, we need to cut cost and you're still in probation period. Yeah? Um, so, and, and, and that sounds a bit odd, but, you know, again, it, you could also obviously come up with some weird explanation in, with regard to performance and so on, but it will just land you in an endless discussion of, of uh, but, but you never really told me what I'm supposed to be doing, I didn't have proper goals, and so on and so forth, which you could have prevented if you would have had proper goals, by the way. But generally, if, you know, be as also here, be try be, try to be as as transparent and up upfront as possible, um, and also once you're done with it, also communicate with the team accordingly. Yeah, just d do not make up a story for the team. Just tell them why you did that. Um, it's always better than than to make up some some story. Yeah? So again, here I think it's it's very important that if you have something like this, we were pretty afraid of what's going to happen with the organization. But nothing happened. And I think it's a testament to the fact that everyone there, uh, or most of our employees, I hope, you know, uh, like to be there and know why they're there. And so a little disruption like this does not really throw them off uh, of their game entirely. Yeah? Another thing is growth. What do startups do? They grow. Funny thing, sometimes they don't. Now the problem is, like as long as you have a business that grows like 20% month for a month, you don't need company culture. Growth is your company culture. Everyone is like high on, on your own sort of uh, growth supply and everyone's like, yeah, we're killing it. And you, just, you show charts like every week, everything goes to the top right. That's fine. The problem is once that growth stalls, then this, this thing is gone, we have this magical, like, we're amazing because we're growing, is gone, yeah? So, in my experience, what really is important there is, like, coming back to vision and, and also mission. It's like, yeah, we're not growing, but we're still, s in, in our case, for example, with the cleaning business, we're still giving jobs to, like, 500 people and, and growing slowly. Um, so it's, it, you know, it makes sense for, it's sort of 
a little help for society when it's a drop in the ocean, but uh, there's a little help for society. And the reason I'm doing this is, you know, to be part of, of this help. Um, so you, you, you need something to believe in, something that keeps you going, because the growth thing is gone, right? Obviously, the best dynamic is to have both, um, and I hope uh, you all... Uh, you all will experience this, but I can tell you even if in a Delivery Hero, which was an amazing success story, we were like properly fucked like three times and we didn't grow. No money, didn't grow, 20 lawsuits, and then you see if the team is working or not. Yeah? And um, so, so this is really, really important that, that you, that's why I say build this into your business early and don't put a band-aid on it when it's too late. Yeah, because there's there's band aids like oh yeah let's, let's make a bigger party it's like, and but people will realize it's like ah yeah we missed this before and now you're like uh, it's free beer free mate and bigger party, that's not that's not what's gonna save you yeah Try, start earlier, and then maybe the last thing is uh, pivot yeah as some of you may know um, our cleaning business started out as a um, private household cleaning business. Uh, we expanded to four markets, so Germany plus three. Um, it went so good that today we are in one market and uh, we sold one uh, last week and we closed two. Uh, plus the market we're in, we changed our business. Uh, so um, pivots. Uh, we changed, we initially were a company that cleaned private households. Today, from a revenue perspective, 80% of our revenue is coming from business cleaning and plants and fruits for offices. So we went through a massive pivot in the business and what that meant is that a lot of people that have been doing A before are now doing B. And that's also a thing where um, I think it's really important that everyone doesn't, like nobody becomes too comfortable. And, and by too comfortable I mean, you know, this, you need to push your organization from time to time to, to really you know, keep everyone a little bit on their toes um, so that in case you need them to move fast and in case you need your employees to do something else from tomorrow on, that they're ready and willing to do so. Yeah? Of course, that doesn't work in every sort of function, but generally we had uh, no problem like moving employees from uh, customer service jobs to sales job, from customer service to product management, and so on. And um, most of the employees actually embrace it, and it can, you can make a, a pretty good, you know, it, it can uh, reflect pretty well in your organization because it also shows everyone that there's a chance to, you know, not climb the ladder, but um, change into other also interesting or maybe more interesting functions. So in our case, um, we basically changed a bit in terms of communication to, uh, we went back to growth and this is a good business case because it, in the business, in the B2B segment, we're actually growing really well and the market is huge. So from a communication perspective, we didn't change ma many things we didn't change. So we still do the Friday Tiger Feast, we still do the, the whether we reach our targets or not, but there's a bit less of the, uh, of the you know, building jobs and more on the building technology going after the big market. And that's, that sounds maybe a bit mean in the sense that, oh, you know, you're playing your team, um, but it's just a way of like really making sure that you communicate what you're after and uh, again, why you're doing it. Yeah? And also has to be a, a bit uh, to do with, I think, ethics, if you wish. Like the reason, the reason why I go after this case is because the B2B cleaning market is huge. And, and, you know, and not because I, I'm a true believer in the fundamental change that is needed in the facility services industry in Germany. It's not. No. It's like a very big market, very large, very old players, very fragmented on the supply side when it comes to small cleaning companies, ideal playing field for technology consolidation play. That's why I like it. Yeah. And, and not because I believe in changing the industry. Um, good. So a few, I mean, <laughs> there's obviously plenty of these, but uh, uh, Lou, I don't know when I started talking. It feels like a long time ago, but am I somewhere around the 20 minutes? Okay. Um, so yeah, so then I would suggest we do uh, Q&A and, so and end the monologue. Thank you very much.
and let's keep on that really nice uh, conversation and insights. Anyone wants to start? Yeah. So uh, first of all, thank you for the talk. It was really interesting. Um, I have a question because yesterday I had a conversation with Jan Mixaika from Holzbrick Venture and he told me that um, for knowledge-driven companies like tech and gaming whatsoever, that's 80% of people, the value of a company. And how would you suggest, because you say it's not about filling positions, um, if a company um, grows tremendously, what do you think are the three areas uh, a company should focus on? Is it maybe uh, feedback or, yeah. Um, yeah, so I think, um, so one thing is that uh, the founding team or the founder um, should recruit her or himself as long as possible. So, you know, there's this very famous example of Stripe where if you want to be hired by Stripe, you actually have to talk to the Collison brothers and you have to fly to San Francisco. They, I mean, they pay the flight, but they fly you to San Francisco to talk to the guys because they want to see you, right? And I think... And there have been many instances where someone went through like the six or seven interviews and then got declined. So that I think is one thing is like make sure that you stay, uh, 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 you know, on top yourself. You know the thing where B people hire C people and then suddenly you're surrounded by idiots. So yeah, don't delay that as much as possible. Um, and then the second thing, um, again, I think is it was really important, especially when you grow fast, it's important that everyone knows the direction of where you want to grow because often you're lacking in processes um, because you can't like, you know, develop your whole process uh, uh, structure and everything as quickly as possible. So you need to make sure that you, you hire people that can think and then you need to give them, as I said, sort of the guidelines in, in which they should think so that you can achieve your expected outcome. Um, and then uh, thirdly, I would say if, you know, if you're growing crazy and, and you can afford, like, don't, don't go too cheap when it comes to hiring, like, core people. Um, because it's just, how to say, like, again, accounting, delivery hero or leave uh, early. We basically hired very junior people. And it really cost us a lot of money later on because we had like KPMG with 20 guys for one year cleaning up our accounting mess. So with that money, we could have, you know, <laughs> we could have hired uh, the senior accountant from heaven. Um, so, um, so I think don't go too cheap. Like, you know, if for your key positions, um, you know, even if you feel like, okay, this this would be. 60k euro salary but and then you have someone amazing that is coming in at 75 i just do it like because don't do the extra round and just get over with it and move on awesome thanks hi thank you for the talk um my question is more in the vc uh, part of the thing uh, so, since VC is such a reputation-driven business, um, with a general, with a relative lack of capital and good deals to chase around, how would a first-time fund go about establishing itself as a good VC firm or earning the returns that LPs demand? Um, yeah. So I think, you know, in our case, I can tell you what we try and how you know how we try to do it. Um, so for us. Um, I would say the positive thing with us is that all partners are uh, 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 more or less have have a quite long entrepreneurial experience, and and so we're quite visible in the in the scene. So in terms of in terms of you know initial visibility, we're there. We've been angel investing for quite a while. Um, all of us, not all, but most of us had like quite significant angel investment returns. So we, there's something to prove, right? Even though it's not like to prove that we, m you know, might be capable to to do this, uh, also to to LPs. Um, so so uh, I think it's important that you have uh, you know a certain visibility. Um, for us, again, it was because we've just been around for a while. But that could also be you can also establish your visibility like like Point Nine does it by you know 
creating great content or whatever. But I think th that's one thing that is important. The other thing is, you know, um, stay like for us, we want to be, we're all ex entrepreneurs or are still entrepreneurs. And the reason why our fund exists is because VCs generally piss me off. It's just like, yeah, it's like not responsive, whatever. And sometimes, we screw up ourselves, but generally, you know, we try to hold ourselves to the standard of like trying to be the VC that you want to work with. And that's with like right now we have a we have a, a discussion around a convertible, like a bridge that's supposed to be done in a company and so on. And we were just the first fund that just sent something to everyone. It's like, okay, we're doing this now. And so very simple, like be as simple as possible, straightforward, take decisions quickly. Um, don't like bullshit around. It's like, yeah, maybe you can do this, maybe not, whatever. It's just, it just screws with the head of the entrepreneur and it doesn't make the company more successful, right? Because if the, if the entrepreneur is thinking about whether you're gonna, whether you're gonna screw him or not, then this is, you know, so, so I think that is, that is really important. And then, you know, de deal flow, again, our, our best deals, I think, and that's ultimately how you're gonna prove that you're gonna be successful is performance. Um, Best deals uh, typically come from, and, and that's a sort of a, a thing that everyone says, network. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it, it can only come from close friends of yours. But it's for me, it's really important. Same with hiring. It's like get to know the teams um, and, and you know sit with them, spend the time in a workshop and, and go through strategy. You may still decline afterwards, right? So we had one firm, amazing product, cool founders. We, we did two strategy workshops with them spent probably c combined 12 hours um, and then we declined because it just didn't, we're not the right fit. And our best companies are those companies where we have a great fit, uh, both personally, but also from a point of view, what we can bring to the table. And obviously I could be talking about this for another hour. But yeah. Thank you. Yeah, uh, also thank you for the talk. Thanks, um, thanks for being here. <laughs> So my question is, um, how do you stay unique? Um, what I mean is, um, when you were working on Lieferheld or Delivery Hero, um, <coughs> there was also obviously uh, Lieferando. And so I want to know, how do you stay unique? How do you differ yourself? How do you stay different? And like, how do you establish a USP if there's also some somebody who's very similar or another company that's very similar to yours? And uh, I mean, there were also several other companies. Yeah. Um, how do you not focus on your competition? How do you just stay in your lane and just focus on your product? Because at the end of the day, you know, like I start with the end of your question. Um, because at the end of the day, assuming that you're in a market that is as big as you say it is on your investor deck, um, you will not have a, an issue with your other startup competition, you know. Because it's like, as I said, yeah, maybe they're twice your size, but then you're tiny and they're twice tiny, right? So it's like, there's not gonna be a market issue. It's maybe a perception issue, it's a different, but 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 so for you, don't obsess over your competitors because it's really, it it drives bad decision making. You, you It's like when, with Liefeld early, when we went to, um, initially we didn't start with pizza, we started with like general Asian food, yeah, so Vietnamese and, and and so when we asked the guys, like, how, how did you define the price of this menu? <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's just 20 cents cheaper than the other guy around the block. It's like, it's not a good pricing strategy, you know? Um, but, you know, so I, I would highly not encourage you to do that. Um, now, uniqueness is obviously, uh, it's a f like how unique you have to be is sort of a function of different factors or, or like money, for example, right? Um, if you have a, a massive marketing budget, uh, you know, you can basically, like do the Zalando thing and just go crazy on TV and, and, and hammer yourself into your heads of, even though you're doing the same thing like Otto did and so on. But for us, um, one differentiator was always uh, like Lieferheld. Uh, this, it's not an actual word, right? So, it, so we made this up. It, we, we almost were Liefer Prince, but luck, luckily that didn't happen. <laughs> um, so, um, and then we created this, uh, today the Lieferheld is a different, uh, um, you know, uh, a character, but early we had a, a character that la had like a glass helmet, was a bit chubby, and just generally looked really stupid. So the idea was that you just give this a face, and peop some people might love it, and some people might hate it, but 
very few people are like meh, you know, because meh is like the death of your brand, if you wish, right? Um, so if you, like the worst name, for example, is, is something like, you know, finanzen24.de or whatever. It's like, I mean, it can work, obviously. There's check 2024 but generally speaking, like especially if you're in a competitive market, that's not helping you. Because you cannot also, the second thing is, you, and that becomes then again in terms of USP. If you're in a, mar in a, if you have a product, like Delivery Hero, we're not selling our own product. We're selling someone else's product. Hence, we cannot define the price. Hence, the price is the same on every platform. So you can also not define the, the selection because the selection is the same on every platform. So you really have to differentiate yourself uh, on, on a different level. And for us, we always try to be a bit quirkier and, and just be a bit older than our competition. The, um, and, and I think that we had a certain demographic that, that this appealed to. Yeah? So um, the good thing is with, with having a character, for example, is like you can really emotionally charge the brand. Like you can do things with this character, right? Whereas if you're like some generic, whatever no-name brand, there's nothing you can do. And it's the same thing with Book of Tiger. We never had the budgets that our competitor had in, in terms of, uh, you know, yeah. SEM budgets, whatever. Um, but we were able to have a very high sort of awareness because our brand was so weird. It's like, why would you book a tiger? Like, who does that? And, and so it, it would fail like the radio test and all these things when it comes to like how to find a company name, but it, 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 it sort of hits the stickiness test, right? And I think so, again, brand is, is one thing to build a USP in a, in a very sort of competitive and, and exchangeable business. Yeah, I have a question on your vision because you said uh, vision is very important. And no, I not eyesight vision. <laughs> no. <laughs> I guess you see better than I do because you don't have glasses. Uh, <laughs> anyhow, um, I would be very interested in your vision of Book of Tiger because you said like uh, it's a good play, <coughs> play field for, for growth. And um, then my second part would be how often did you change your vision? And the third part would be from a VC perspective, if you find a startup where you see they have a lack of vision, do you think it's something you can create with them together? Um, yeah, so I'll start at the beginning. Yeah. So, so for us, um, the vision now is different than what it used to be. So in terms of changing it, we, we've been having the same uh, a vision and mission for the first sort of three and a half years of the business. Until we realize that you know what we want to do now is is very different and has a very different motivation behind it, right? So now what we're saying is like we're building the first digital facility services platform. That sounds very technical, but then there's a couple of things like that start with we believe that and so on, and uh, so it's but it's a very I would say functional vision in a sense that. Um, yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, as I said, it's not, we're not trying to make the world a better place in the first, as in the first, uh, you know, as a first goal, if you wish. Um, yeah, what exactly it says, I don't want to tell you um, because we're being recorded, but <laughs> maybe I can tell you later. <laughs> um, then secondly, what's the question with regarding to changing it, right? Um, so I think generally it's okay to iterate on it. You know, like I think, when you when you start a business, some like as I said, there's rarely a case where it's just a straight line from A to B or A to Z. Um, so, in general, um, I think it's okay to iterate on it, and then may maybe also in case of a pivot, ditch it and and come up with something new, right? In our case, the reason why we didn't say okay, screw it, we start a new company was because we have a, a really great team and we've built a good platform that we could use. Right, but otherwise you could also say, okay, let's start a new business because that's essentially what it is. And so, for, and from an investor point of view, I would not expect someone to, you know, have the most structured, uh, 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 you know, presentation on, 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 you know, vision and mission and and all that kind of stuff. I, I would not expect. However, I need something more than, you know, um, we we compared. 
a few business models and uh, and this just have has the best CLTV. You know, that's not, I mean, that's a bit meh. Um, so, so, uh, but it also doesn't need to be uh, like a very, like the driver, for example, the motivation, it doesn't have to be, you know, someone passed away and I want to facilitate, like in my, fa whatever, it's, it doesn't have to be like that. So I think it's fine. You need to have an idea of what you want to build, like how is that important for, like, e for anyone, um, and then you can sit with a team and, and work on that. I'm also not a big believer in the where are you in five years thing, because pff, who knows, <laughs> you know? So, and, and uh, even as the, the company that I referenced before that is crazy successful, there, you know, yeah, you have experienced VCs on the table and, and, and there's a discussion whether to enter a country or not and the discussion takes forever. So how would you, ex how would you expect a founder who probably does this for the first time, how would you expect her to know, you know, the internationalization strategy for the next five years? You don't. Hi. Um, I was just wondering um, on company culture, how did you maintain that company culture in the early days when, say, you weren't there sort of 90% of the time? Um, well, you have to be there 90% of the time. I mean, that's, that's how it starts, right? So if you're, say, out of office selling the business and you're not around your team, I also yeah. you mentioned the start of the sort of presentation when people start. Was that enough or was there other things you had to do? The depends. I mean, of course, it depends a bit on, 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 uh, uh, on your company size, I would say. But generally, I mean, if, like if, you're, if you're the only person and you're not around, that's a problem. Um, then you might want to find someone to start or run the business together with you. Because, uh, yeah, I just for me, I think presence, uh, your energy, it needs to be there. At least, you know, when you're in the same room and, uh, and, and so people feel like, you know, your enthusiasm and, and your energy and, and this needs to, you know, this translates into your team and that's, that's one of the superpowers of, of small teams. If you're not there, it's just a lost group of people that don't know what to do. So, uh, yeah, so that presence is, is very important. And then um, uh, with regard to like onboarding, of course, like what, what, I, what I like to do is, for example, there is, um, I do long meetings with uh, new employees, for example, in uh, engineering, product management, business intelligence, sales, where we go through our current investor pitch deck. We explain like what does, what's a venture back company. But essentially, it's like we're losing whatever, 200 grand a month and you could be out of a job in four months. You just need to know that. Okay, thank you. So we go through this, uh, explain the business model. Also for employees that seemingly do not have anything to do with, you know, the business model in a sense that how much margin do we do between us and the partner company, for example, right? But still, um, so it's not the only thing we do. There's, a, there's other things around that um, for sort of the onboarding period. And then there's ongoing things, right? Like, you know, we do like peer language classes and what have you, right? So Very back, there was there's someone in queue for next time. <laughs> okay, I'll come to you after. Tried, tried a few times already. <laughs> so, a uh, personal question to you. Uh, how do you manage to uh, do what seems like uh, two full-time jobs between Booker Tiger and the Cavalry VC? And uh, uh, a related follow-up is why would you do that? Meaning, is the first company stabilized enough and you feel that uh, you know, you can take some time off to focus on the other one. Uh, yeah, just curious about. Um, so, um, I think the only way you can properly do it is you have a, a, a good team in place or like good uh, colleagues that support you. Um, and, and so for me, that's been one of the big learnings uh, and I've been really, really bad at this like First of all, like finding the right people around me so I can be more sort of efficient and, and, and stay as effective. Um, and, and then also for finding those people and then also uh, uh, empowering them to, to actually do that, right? And I think I've just gotten better at this, you know, like I, I used to be super like 
at, at Delivery Hero, we had, uh, by the time I left, uh, you know, I had like a team of um, 10 plus product managers and then we had like uh, uh, 11 or 12 engineering teams and, and everything and, and people were very capable, but I was super hands on and therefore super stressed, right? So I was like, I was sitting in like planning meetings and this, that, and then we bought a company somewhere. So I had to fly there and then the planning meeting didn't happen and all this stuff. I could have saved myself that, I, I later realized. Um, but so the, the, the key for me is just have good people and put them in charge, right? And then, um, yeah, be very uh, uh, transparent or upfront um, on, uh, in what you expect. Um, the other thing, why? Uh, so for me, it's, you know, this whole investing thing is always, has always been interesting. I've been doing angel investments, uh, most of them bad, um, some of them uh, luckily better. Uh, but it's always interesting because I like to, because you can't start all the companies yourself. I, it's, it's like, you see so many things and you're like, ah, oh, someone should do this, right? Why isn't there that? Yeah, well, I can't do it. So the closest thing to doing it yourself is to like invest in people who are doing it, right? So at least this gives you the opportunity to sort of participate a little bit. Um, yeah, and that's the reason. And that for me, it's the same reason why I did angel investing and now we're doing the fund. Um, the fund is just a more, um, actually takes me less time than angel investing before because as I said, now I get an email, this company is doing a convertible. We have an associate on it who is very capable and I say, Bjorn, can you do that? And I, that's done for me. Whereas before it would have been, okay, to read the thing, uh, maybe worst case I have to like go to notary at some point and so on. So this is all removed. So it's actually less time. Uh, how do you assess culture fit in an interview? Yeah, so uh, one idea is, so ask ask really dumb questions and then see how the person reacts to it. And, and, and so, uh, but try these questions with people that fit your culture well beforehand. Yeah, so, so you kind of get the range of like what's expected uh, behavior to questions. Yeah, so... Um, um, so, th so that's that's one thing, and that's what I think. Like, if you let's say, I wanted to ask you what what your favorite uh, underwear or boxer short color is, right? And then you're like, okay, I'm gonna ask him this question in interview, and then you're not gonna do this because because you're a pussy, right? You're like, ah, fuck, I wanted to ask. It's like, yeah, it's like, but do it, right? Maybe not the underwear question, but um, like, think of qu something that is odd. Try it out, and then. Do it, and then you see how the person reacts. So that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is like think about how, like how do you how do you work, and what do you expect from the people that work very closely with you, and then put uh, the candidate to the test uh, with a real world thing. It's like, you know, for me, for me. Um, <laughs> so when I need an, an ana analysis of something, um, I, I want, so. When I ask you a question for an, uh, some some analysis to be done, I want to have sort of the the raw data attached, but I want to be able to have the conclusion in sort of the email, right? So I don't because if you're on a mobile, I want to know what what your attachment says in the email. So what we do, for example, is we do tests. Uh, again, someone in the audience did a test uh, with us. Um, um, and we do tests it's like, oh, we see how, okay, how does this person do things, right? Of course, there is certain things you can change, but there is like, if you receive something that's full of typos, um, if that person is German and it's full of like sloppy typos, then that person is probably just sloppy, right? If that person is whatever um, from India and has to write German and has and makes spelling mistakes, is a different question. So, real world test. Uh, Sometimes with engineers, we do test work. Like we get people in for like a day, um, yeah. So that's those are two things that um, are, are sort of you know things you can do. Um, for me, what's really important is I also discuss things that are outside of work. Like you know, I like to understand someone's worldview a little bit. Uh, that doesn't have to be conformant with mine. You know, it's just like I want to understand like okay, how does that person think? Um, so for me, that's about it. Some of it you can do by phone, some of it you have to do in person. Hi, 
Um, so now there are these technologies for HR uh, that allows you to track like how much time your employee spends on the computer, uh, how much time he speaks with other employees, how many holidays or like they there is um, a sort of systems that analyze the emails and track whether the employee is happy or not. Do you think that it's good for culture? Could be could improve it or could be too pushy? <laughs> Um, well, generally, I wouldn't say there is anything wrong with you having sort of a, 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 a how to say, a quantitative approach to understanding the happiness of your organization. You know, I think there's nothing wrong with that as long as that is sort of one input factor for you, right? So I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't have a, a software telling me like, something is bad and then just just act on it right so it needs to be part of your tool set that you that you have uh, with regard to yeah tracking how often people speak with each other and so on depends a bit to what end right what, what like what what's the end res what what's the end result if it's for like tracking or understanding the you know health of your organization fine ish but then it kind of very quickly drifts into productivity and these kind of things so in in that sense i think just not knowing you know what but i think think about it that way maybe the downside outweighs the potential upside um, um but yeah i would have to look at it so i would be skeptical to be honest yeah Um, so I have a question regarding venture capital and entrepreneurship at the same time. Um, I'm currently trying to raise seed capital, but I'm missing a key role in my uh, team currently, which is the CTO. So how would you go about that? You said that hiring key roles is really important. You shouldn't make a wrong hire. But now I'm thinking, okay, I should try to find a hire pretty soon to raise capital. Or can I raise capital without this key role and then hire afterwards? Depends. If you study mark, if you if you studied marketing and you want to build an AI company, you really have to find that CTO. Uh, if uh, you know, if your business is something that uh, you know you don't, is not like anything deep tech, uh, you could probably come by with uh, with uh, you know, without that position really having like someone long term in place so for the way the way i look at it is i like i like founding teams to be as self sustaining as possible in a sense that they don't need much outside help right because um that typically makes things slower and and you know iterations take longer especially in the early stage if you're dependent on an outside party it just takes longer um so um, I can like I can tell you at the uh, beginning of Booker Tiger we were working with an outsourced company in Poland. But what we did is we basically hired them under the condition that they would come here three three weeks per month. Um, so they were sitting in our office, um, and and only after that our CTO joined because he was still at Delivery Hero before. So um, and that you know is maybe a bit different circumstances because we did have a little more more experience or whatever, but no one had a problem with that also because what we were building was not rocket science right it was yeah it, like people would believe that a good outsourcer team that works in-house can do it right so um yeah it really depends on on what what uh, what your business is but generally speaking i i like this is not a plus let's put it that way right but if you're like if you're a, a uh, um you know, uh, if your case is compelling, if your vision is great, if you're a great person, if if people believe that you know you're the guy to do it, then this is not a, a killer criteria, right? It could, like we invested in in two guys. One is the one guy is 23, the other guy is 24. Both studied uh, business, um, no technical knowledge. One guy did uh, went to Le Wagon, some programming school for three mo three months. 
uh, they slapped together a prototype and that was a prototype really but you know you could see that it's kind of working it has to be rebuilt from scratch but it was good enough and it didn't hinder us like it didn't prevent us from investing How did you gain the necessary domain knowledge for Booker Tiger and for Leaf Ahead? So I give you the, the quick run through. I did a bank apprenticeship when I was 16 because I'm Swiss, so every Swiss person has to do a bank apprenticeship. Um, after that, uh, I, uh, I, I, uh, I started programming when I was quite young, so I uh, started my first sort of web design company when I was uh, 18. And then um, the websites had to be hosted somewhere, so I started a hosting company uh, that was pre-Amazon AWS and everything. So obviously you have to, you know, have to run your server. So I did that. So uh, and then I started uh, um, a computer science. Uh, uh, and I uh, realized that I'm too too dumb for computer science and changed it into business information systems, which sounds great, but it's like half half. Um, but then you know, uh, then uh, I had. A company in, in, in China where you know we had to we were growing like crazy and we suddenly went from three engineers to like 45 engineers and, and so we had to learn how does uh, product management organization work how does scrum work back then and, and so picked up that stuff there uh, learned SEO uh, back then because uh, what we were doing uh, you could not purchase advertising and you still cannot purchase advertising for this on Google so for certain reasons um, and so I had to learn SEO uh, and so on. So I ba basically picked everything up along the way, um, just experience and, and uh, yeah, uh, doing, doing it wrong or half right at first and then trying to do it better. Now the good thing is, you know, like I can set up a server for you or I can edit the picture in Photoshop or I can do, a I can do a financial model in Excel. So that's pretty handy. Yeah. <laughs> Keep this in mind. You always have one more play left. One more play. You always have one more play left. Until you are at the Amtsgericht, <laughs> there is always one more play you can do. Good luck for me. Good luck for me.